Hi, everyone. I hope you had a great conference so far. There's been some powerful talks around what's possible in the space that we're working through, connecting STEM and art. Um, I'm here to tell a bit of my own personal story of my journey through both of those worlds. So let's start with where I am. My name is Keith Kirkland. I'm a co-founder and chief haptic officer at WearWords. Now haptic simply means touch, like optic is for eyes, haptic is for skin. And what we're doing is, is we're building a communications channel using the skin to deliver information in a more intuitive and less intrusive way. Now we started with the use case of navigation. Navigation is inherently visual and visual-based navigation isn't always safe. Oftentimes it's not practical. And for 285 million people worldwide living with a visual impairment, visual-based navigation is inaccessible. So we built Wayband, a haptic navigation app that pairs with the wristband that gently guides you to your end destination using only vibration without the need for any visual or audio feedback. Now the way it works is, is when you're in the haptic compass, you feel no vibration at all. You swivel slightly left or slightly right and you'll get a tiny vibration. That vibration will get stronger the stronger you turn from the correct way that you have to face. We've tested this with thousands of people and most can figure out the right way to go within a few seconds. It's pretty intuitive. Now, when we first started out, our goal was to get people out of their phones and back into the real world. We saw the use case of haptics as a potential space that was untapped from a point of view. Another visual icon, another audio sound interrupting my experience. We felt there just had to be a better way to do something. Now, my personal story and background into this space is I'm a mechanical engineer by training, one of my trainings. Um, I have two bachelor's degrees and a master's degree. Um, don't necessarily recommend getting so much education, but for me, it was just education was just the easiest way to figure things out um, because I wasn't really sure as I was going through the different stages of my personal journey. So when I started off, at 12 years old, I wanted to be a mechanical engineer. But before that, I could always draw, like since I was six or something like that. Every school I've been into, I got most artistic in the yearbook, you know. And, you know, I remember being in sixth grade, you know, eighth grade, drawing Bart Simpsons for chocolate milk, you know. And when I decided what kind of career I wanted to do as a kid, I never thought about, you know, science or engineering in particular, I thought about being an artist. And then I realized that art just seemed like a very hard and specific road to go. And I wanted to use something that was a bit more valuable and useful. So I got keened in on math because I was really good with math and science. So engineering became my goal. I graduated you know, from Rutgers University with my mechanical engineering degree. And I study and I work as an engineer for six months when I decide I don't want to be an engineer anymore. Um, wasn't quite what I was hoping for. I wanted to like crash test like motorcycles. Um, and I was doing consulting, which was really great work. I was doing energy research work and energy conservation work, but that wasn't where I really felt my passion was at. So after a, a shift out of that world, I realized that to me, this combination of engineering doing ridiculously useful things, even though most people don't understand how the underlying stuff behind it works. And fashion, this idea of art and application brought me into these worlds. And so fashion became my way of exploring both worlds at the same time. And I was immediately drawn to shoe design. And so I enrolled into the Fashion Institute of Technology after working for a year selling shoes at Nordstrom. And left engineering science behind me. I'm a designer now. And I walk in as a shoe designer, I walk out as a handbag designer, and I end up working, um, doing some internships, both into some freelance work with Calvin Klein, which was a dream customer of mine to work for. Um, I ended up working with the sports act doing technical design and engineering work came in handy. And ultimately I ended up 
back uh, into the engineering space, but in fashion, because when I applied to a job at Coach, the position that I ended up getting hired for was a handbag engineer, which I didn't know existed at the time. So I'm kind of feeling like serendipitously beautiful. I'm in this wonderful world. I love my work. I love my space. I love the craftsmanship, the leather making, pattern making, and puzzles. The production piece I also love. You know, like the 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 part that started to concern me was was the impact that we were having as the fashion industry. You know, we were the second largest polluter in the world. You know, there were impacts on body consciousness and what were we really doing other than you know pushing out more product potentially and at the top of that hierarchy i saw like the people who were my heroes being really burnt out in the space from that need to constantly produce at genius level every collection so i started to just kind of rethink personally i was like how can i use this ability of design to kind of help for humanity in some kind of way and ultimately what i did was uh I decided to go back to school again after some thinking for about a year and I enrolled into Pratt, into their industrial design program um, as a master's student this time. I got another bachelor's degree from, from, from FIT. And so I'm in school again for the third time. Now, from my point of view, I'm gonna reset again. Like I'm engineering, but then do that, okay. Handbags, okay, found this thing, but okay, now I'm shifting. Now I'm going into this new world of industrial design, which, you know, I know partially about through my space, but very little about. As we walk through this world, ultimately, I get an opportunity to be one of the, I call it guinea pigs for a program called Global Innovation Design. We got to do an exchange program with Keio University at, in Tokyo and the Royal College of Art and Imperial College of Arts um, program in London. And ultimately, you know, all the schools participated and we worked on this global project with all participants. It really opened up my eyes, one, to the possibility of connecting different pieces around the world. But when I came back, I was really like, wow, I really miss fashion. Like, how can I do this in a way that like really like aligns with like everything that I've done so far? And so I used my thesis year to figure that out. And ultimately what I came up with was I was really interested in movement and technology. And I worked on the premise for a suit that would essentially allow a person to be able to download a complex form of movement like Kung Fu and then have the suit teach you using only vibrations. And so my world into the haptic space essentially was, I was looking at the sense of touch as a way of communicating movement without an instructor necessarily needing to be physically there in space. Tele learning of, of complex movements. And so that was kind of like my dream. I basically saw the matrix way too many times and said, why can't you download Kung Fu yet? Oh, what if you could do that? And tried to build out a world where that would be a thing that would be possible. So that's my personal story. How does that translate into what we've done? Well, me and my co-founders connected and you know we kind of had this idea around the possibility of haptics i explored haptics in this particular space my co-founder kevin was working with haptics and wearables and he was also working with a person who was a friend of his who was blind and visually impaired who came to our school and talked about his challenges just getting around and finding his way to a new building on campus so Kevin and our advisor and co-founder Yang had an idea potentially of building out this piece of what it might look like to do navigation one day for people who are blind and visually impaired. They knew me, we had worked together. And at some point we came together, had a conversation, decided like, let's approach this idea of navigation from the point of view of haptics and touch as the primary means. So, you know, it, it was a, for me, it was a, it was a culmination of, of worlds that all came together. It's like my engineering background came together. My fashion background came together. The industrial design piece came together. My personal love and movement and touch. I'm a martial artist. I'm, I'm a praying mantis, kung fu practitioner at this moment. Also archery and skateboarding, quite a other, few other forms of movements. 
So it's like, I love movements as a personal piece. And ultimately I was always interested in how could we do more with the sense of touch from the point of view of digital communications. So it was a wrap up that kind of came together quite nicely, but it was very much in hindsight. Um, and, I, and I feel that the path doesn't look super clear when you're walking down it, you know, like, when I left engineering and had to talk to my mother and my grandmother around, you know, like going to school to be a shoemaker, essentially, like that was not an easy conversation from a family point of view. When I went back to school again, you know, like it, it was kind of like questioning of yourself and constantly like, are you doing this the right way? And again, I don't recommend necessarily so much school as the main piece of it. But what I recommend is is, is following your own personal pathway, because at the end of the day, you don't know how it could possibly connect. And our story, how does it connect? Well, back in 2017, Wayband Technology, which is the product that we created to navigate, helped the first person who was blind run 15 miles of the New York State Marathon without needing a sighted running guide. Now, we started this company with this idea of, can we get people out of their phones and back into the real world? The blind use case was very far off from a technology standpoint, but we were walking through that process to see like constantly in a scenario kind of what if. As designers, one of the gifts that we had is the ability to, you know, use media and mediums to paint visions of stories that don't quite exist yet for people. You know, we, we shot a video that was like, what would the world look like if you can navigate with haptics, with touch? Right. And people got inspired by the video and the idea and gave us that support to initially see if we could actually build the thing that we were proposing. So a lot of it was hand to mouth. A lot of it was stepping along the way, figuring the pieces out. But I think the, the big part was, was going through the process, being able to put the work out there being understanding of the customer and listening to the customer and ultimately bringing that scientific approach that we learned, you know, from a process of what's going on, what's the problem that we're solving, what's the hypothesis, what is this experiment meant to do? How is this experiment going to impact? And then, you know, applying that into both from a design and an engineering point of view directly into the iteration of the product. So now, we talked about the start of where we started from, you know, the, the beginning um, in our journey, which is navigation. But ultimately, we really see a future and an opportunity where the sense of touch actually is opened up in the same way that screens opened up the visual communications channel for UX design and sound and speakers opened up the ears for constant communication through audio. You see the skin is the next frontier in communications. And while we're starting with navigation, our ultimate goal has always been to build a platform that will enable engineers, developers, creators, and designers to have access to easily creating haptic experiences. And you know, when you look at what research spending is over the last hundred years on each of the five of the senses, you get a disproportionate amount of spend on visual based technologies. Sound is pretty far off, but definitely second. And touch, smell, and taste are quite small. Now, touch is in a prime to come up um, with all the screens that we have around us five, seven screens around you, maybe five of them have speakers in them, but four of them have haptic drivers in them. So there's a latency of haptic potential, as you might want to call it, or possibility that's already existing in our devices. But what are we doing with it? Well, buzz, 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 your phone is ringing, right? Every haptic mostly is just saying, hey, look at me. And I do want to acknowledge that like haptics has come a long way, especially in the last 10 years, where you're looking at companies that are really looking on how to solve the ecosystem challenge because it's challenging. You have to do hardware because haptic is touch and touch requires physical actuation, 
right, or electrostimulation. It, it requires a physical contact with the skin, which is why we're aware words, because haptics are wearable from our point of view, right? And that's the space that we're playing in right now. But, you know, you have air-based haptics, you have ultra haptics doing some amazing work and ultrasonic haptics. So the possibilities of what things ignite touch um, are just beginning to be cracked open and be explored. And the lane that we're really interested in is how do we take abstractions? Now, we have lots of companies that are taking reality, like, oh, this pillow, I want to feel this in virtual reality or in a virtual space, right? You know. Um, or if I have a prosthetic arm and I'm feeling this, I want to translate that feeling directly as it relates to my brain, right? Ridiculously valuable work. But the work that we're looking at in particular in the space, we're looking at how you take the idea of abstraction, right? Where a lot of people working in haptics are doing, you know, creating realism in a virtual space. We're doing essentially like the haptic equivalent of cubism. Like how do we distort break things down to its essence, and then use those essences as ways of delivering information in more intuitive and more effective ways, right? And if I were to kiss you or to punch you in the face, you'd have a lot of information instantly, right? If your bag suddenly got caught on the door handle and your shoulder got snagged as you were walking forward, you'd have a lot of information instantly. How can we tag into these these ideas of what the skin is capable of to figure out ways to not add another icon to a screen, not add another dial to a board, not add another overlaying sound to an experience. Because when you look at that part of it, outside of only tagging into 40% of our sensory capability, it's ridiculously limiting in a space for people with accessibility needs where vision or sound may not be such the available sense. So how do we design for a more inclusive world? Let's use more of the human capability to understand information. You know, the, the beautiful thing about, you know, Illustrator, you know, I'm, I'm a super huge fan of the work that Adobe has done, you know, like, is that like, there's like 20 different ways to grab a brush tool or grab a pen tool you can press p you can walk to the corner you can you can type it you can grab it from the menu you can pull it from it like it allows creatives to work in whatever way they see fit and i'm in san francisco right now having conversations with some of the leaders in like the disabilities community the inclusive and accessibility spaces and we're really talking about the idea of accessibility transforming from a conversation from disability to personalization, right? Because at the end of the day, we all have different accessibility needs, things that suit us. And some of those might be physical or sensory, right? But some of them, or a lot of them might just be preference. And so what does accessibility or personalization now look like when, you know, everyone has a capability to personalize and interact with their own way? And we see touch as being a really big, important part of that platform and that ecosystem as it grows and evolves. So one of the things that, you know, I want to say and, and open up to is that there, the idea of this, this combination of art and STEM is, you know, um, the, 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 the lines were never, the boxes and the lines were never there in the first place. They were always imaginary, right? And so creativity and its tools that you utilize that creativity for and so the ends that you utilize it for is what both art and STEM represent together. As a painter, as a sketcher, I use the paper mediums and tools I have available to create the best particular vision that I'm looking to implement into my you know, own mind or maybe potentially someone else's as a piece of work. As a technologist, I build products and experiences that also represent the ethos of what I want someone to be able to experience. Hands free, eyes free, ears free, navigation experience that isn't overloading you with information or an easy way to make haptic experiences because when I was trying to build this Kung Fu suit, every punch I threw would break the system. 
And now, you know, opening up that technology to the world ultimately makes it easier for the up and coming, you know, technologists and creators, essentially all of you to build experiences and opportunities off of this world. So I just want to say thank you so much for the time. It was great being here with you all. Hope you've gotten a lot out of it.